What actually happened here at the real Battle of Mississinawa, which we are not portraying today, was there were 600 regular troops started uh, attacking small native villages all along in this area to try and drive them out. And um, that's why we had our moment of silence because there was a battle very close to here as they tried to take back this territory. There were women and children that were taken captive. There was 12 inches of snow on the ground. There you go. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the, the guns? Well, how big are those cannons? So, field cannons during the War of 1812 uh, usually were in the range of from six pound to nine pounds to 12 pound cannons. And that rating was by the weight of the cannonball. So a six pound cannon fired a six pound solid iron cannonball and so on. They also had shells, which were hollow. And when you were talking earlier about Francis Scott Key and the bombs bursting in air, those were shells. So the cannonball would blow up and throw fragments all over. I recently read that there was um, a new technology being used in that battle, too, that caused some of the stuff in the sky. The rockets, yes. The rockets were new. They were British invention. Uh, a British artillery officer called Congreve came up with these rockets. They were very unreliable. Uh, but they fired and then an explosive charge when they landed. And uh, the, <laughs> the heads of the army felt they were probably a more risk to their own army than the enemy. So they didn't use them a lot. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna be crazy. Watch for smoke rings sometimes in That's this cool. weather. There's one. But, but you'll notice as this battle goes on that the smoke the smoke gets thicker and thicker, and you can imagine how difficult it might have been for troops to see each other. I'm sure you've experienced that. The, uh, you'll notice that the artillery hits are getting very close to the blockhouse, so it's becoming a little desperate for the people around the blockhouse. And they hit it. So they're sending in infantry now. This is militia, correct? This is militia, correct. Can you explain to them what militia means? Militia were citizen soldiers, uh, usually uh, not uniformed, so they brought their own clothing, often their own weapons, but they were the second line of defense behind the regular army. Why are they all standing so close together? The typical approach to the weapons was because they were smoothbore weapons and not very accurate at long range, if they grouped people together, it was the effect of a giant shotgun. So it was more effective uh, in terms of inflicting ca casualties on the enemy. And now you can see some American regulars coming up to support the militia. And for the little ones in the audience, an American regular would be somebody who signed up to join the army and probably got a paycheck. Notice how their clothes match, whereas the militia does not. They are all different. What are some of the commands they're giving as they fire? Uh, they're giving the... Uh basic commands to load. After they've loaded the weapons, they have to cock them to make them ready to fire. Then the order will be given for them to aim and then finally to fire. So they're firing volleys. That's when all the soldiers fire at the same time. They can also have various ways of firing where one rank will fire, then the second, or they can fire by files from right to left, depending on the situation. Just fucking kill me. 
So here we're firing the militia by ranks. See how the ones in front have kneeled down if you can still see them through the smoke. And the best reenactment was yesterday, 1812. And this is just so small. So you can see they're sending in more militia. Oh and they're attacking the blockhouse from both sides in a pincer movement to try and cut down on the effectiveness of the defense. Look okay, where's the other people at? They just had this little small. Look, I see here. someone out there behind the brush. Do y'all see them? I wonder who that is. It's the Indians. Don't look like regular soldiers. People in the blockhouse, I think, are in pretty serious trouble now. They're badly, badly outnumbered. Where's the Indians? Come help them. Who are the soldiers in the green frocks? The green, green-coated green soldiers are riflemen, and they're unique in the army in that their weapon is a rifle. That means it has grooves in the barrel, and it makes the bullets spin, and they're much more accurate. The blue-coated soldiers have smoothbore muskets. Imagine the barrels like a shotgun. Uh, so the riflemen are snipers, essentially. The drone. A drone. So one detachment seems to have detected something in the woods and they're going out to investigate. There's gentlemen with very, very fancy hats like yours standing over there at the back. Who would that be? Uh, that's the commanding officer of the rifles. That's why he's in green. Uh, the riflemen that are here are wearing the summer, summer uniform, which was a green linen frock. But in the winter, they wore green wool uniforms, somewhat like the officers. And the, the hat he's wearing is called a chapeau bras. Someone's firing back at them. Who's that? So, they're native warriors in the brush, and the threat here is that you can't tell how many they are. Each, each time they fire, they move to a new location. Look at that smoke ring. Yep. The American awesome. artillery is now firing on British cannon that have come onto the field at the other end. There's more troops approaching here from our left. Who's coming onto the field now? So this is attachment of the British Army. They're being led by soldiers in green who are also riflemen. So both sides used rifle armed soldiers to combat the enemy's riflemen. The red coat soldiers are armed with smoothbore muskets just like the American soldiers. So the American riflemen have come forward to sort of break up the British attack. So it's a detachment of British rifles are coming down to oppose the American riflemen.
And now, a bit of a nasty surprise for the American riflemen, this body of troops that are coming are British light infantrymen. They fight dispersed, uh, but they're regular soldiers. They're armed, they're armed with muskets, but they take advantage of ground cover and whatever to skirmish with the enemy. Both sides seem to have the taller hats and they have large brass plates on the front. Are those all the same or are they different? The, the, the caps that have the false fronts on them were actually copied from the Portuguese. So the British have more skirmishers and they're pushing back the American riflemen. I see horses now. What, what role did horses play in these battles? Well, soldiers on foot were very vulnerable to cavalry. So they, they tended to form together either in clusters or squares to protect themselves against horses. I've heard that horses at this time were like the tanks of the army. Pretty much. There's a bagpiper on the field. What purpose does he serve? Well, the... All regiments had uh, drummers and fifers. In the Scottish regiments, the fifers were replaced with bagpipers. And they transmitted orders. There's no electronic, there's no radio. The only way that the officers can convey their commands to the troop is by using the drums, the fifes, the bagpipes. That's how they gave all their orders. Now another unit is entering the field from the British side, and they're wearing, some of them are wearing red coats, but they're actually militia that were given cast-off coats from the regular army, and this was to make it appear that there were more regular soldiers than there were. young boy is acting as a messenger, uh, sending orders from officers to other parts of the unit. Do you see how thick the smoke is getting and how hard it is for them to see what they're doing? Well, look at the back where the natives, natives and uh, American militia are skirmishing. You can barely see them for the smoke. You have to watch for the flashes from the muzzles of the gun to see where they are. So the British are pushing strongly against the U.S. forces and forcing them back. Officers that only have an epaulet on one shoulder. What does that mean? Uh, so in both the American and British armies, junior officers only had one epaulet. So lieutenants and captains had a single epaulet. Majors and colonels had two. The 
Americans and the British are still firing their cannons at each other. So you notice the British are trying to form a long continuous line to sweep the American forces back. Native warriors at the back end of the field are keeping the troops opposed to them fully occupied by changing positions and threatening the flanks of the American soldiers. So the British don't have to contend with the rest, they only have to contend with what's in front of them. Are these Indians fighting with the British? Is that why they're coming up behind them? Yes. Uh, by and large, the, the British had heavy reliance on Native allies. In wooded country, the natives rule supreme. They, they could ambush any force and um, there was great reluctance to fight not in the open where you could see your enemy. The British have irregular cavalry on their side as well and you can see the American riflemen clustered into a small group. That's to protect themselves against the horsemen. Yes, they're starting to withdraw. I think the pressure on them is too great. So they always leave a rear guard to try and slow up the enemy advance. I think the drummer is probably beating a parlay, meaning they want to negotiate. American troops are rapidly leaving the field. left is a tiny American rear guard. Will they negotiate and reach terms now? They, they can. It, it depends on what happens. If the American army just continues to retreat, there may be no settlement. But uh, if they negotiate, yes, they may negotiate a surrender. team is coming forward. They're going to parlay with the British. The British colonel is going out to meet them.
think the British colonel is pointing out that uh, the American negotiating position is not particularly strong. They appear to be searching the dead and wounded. The negotiations have concluded. We want to make sure while you're visiting <coughs> Mrs. Senoa 1812 today that you know that any of these reenactors would be thrilled if you would ask them questions, ask them about their clothing, ask them about the food they're cooking, ask about their tent, ask about their weapons, anything you want to know. Ask more about the war. We'd love to talk to you. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Silence for rising the dead. Yeah. Got it. Silence and raising of the dead. Yeah. We already. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we could have a moment of silence to commemorate those who did die once again years ago. The troops are just mustering into position, and then we'll ask them to remove their caps and observe a moment of silence for the dead. So I'd ask you to remove your caps and observe a moment of silence in honor of the dead. Thank you. Now the American Army is going to come up and join us here. They'll be here in just a moment. This is a good time to get pictures. While they're up close and not obscured in smoke. These reenactors travel from all over the country, from Canada. They all get their own clothes, either make them, buy them, do all their own research, spend a lot of time and money to do this because they love history and they want to share it with you.
So the U.S. Army is marching back onto the field now. That's my old boy from elementary school. I don't see him anymore. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. 